in America who have actually been teaching our students by distance learning for many, many years. They're going to introduce themselves, so I won't, I won't go on and do that, but they're joining us by video conference via Fuse meeting. So uh, welcome, Paul and Joanne. Thank you. We'd like to uh, enter conference, uh, your very positive conference, I hope, uh, this uh, afternoon, by telling you a little bit about a uh, collaborative online teaching uh, endeavor that we've had with the University of Manchester between the faculty and staff there and the faculty and staff here at Stony Brook University. We've been teaching online together for over seven years and we'd like to share some of uh, how we got started and some of the best practices and what we've learned with you so that if anyone has any questions afterwards they can feel free to ask us. I'm Joanne Souza. I am the director of the Biology Online program here at Stony Brook University. Uh, Biology Online basically handles all the interactive portions of the live lecture classes, which are sometimes upwards of 900 students. And we also handle the redeployment of those assets into the online learning environment during different semesters. Uh, I am a psychologist, and uh, basically I've been in academia approximately 12 years. But uh, in my prior life, I was a business and communications expert for AT&T. I worked in the health and education uh, venue, looking to help people meet a business objectives in health and education using technology. So it followed over into my academic career. Very soon you'll meet uh, Paul Bingham. Paul has been in academia and research for over 30 years. He's a professor here, a tenured faculty member at Stony Brook University in the life sciences, and you'll meet him shortly. We've been working in collaboration with Carolyn Bowser, a faculty of life sciences there at the uh, University of Manchester, Ian Miller, who's the e-learning manager, and Dan Levin, an e-learning technologist. It's been a fantastic collaboration, and we've learned much through working together. So basically, I'll tell you how we got started and what some of our problems were and how we solved them. Uh, Paul and I taught a large live lecture class, uh, a very popular upper division uh, elective course, actually, that over a third of the university students here at Stony Brook take. And of course, as the course got bigger and bigger, we started to have some issues with meeting our objectives. Basically, we were doing something that looks like a Broadway theater. So our objectives were to communicate better to the students. We wanted to teach better. Of course, we wanted the students to learn, but not through memorization. We wanted them to learn to understand the concept, to think like a scientist, and to doubt everything they thought they knew coming in the room. And of course, to, to determine what a falsifiable hypothesis was, how to analyze empirical data. The students, on the other hand, were looking to get a good grade in the class, and they wanted to learn something useful that they could take with them into their careers. And they wanted to build their scientific skills. Of course, in a live lecture hall, this is basically very difficult to meet these objectives. Because typically, what happens is you speak, from the front of the talking head, you throw the information out there to the students, basically, trying to get some feedback from the first few students in the front rows, and you're not really understand, understanding whether you're meeting their objectives or not, or meeting yours. Then, of course, you get to the exams where they get to feed back to you, where they think what they understood, they find out they didn't based on their exam score, and we sit there scratching our head trying to figure out what they didn't understand. So we needed to close that gap in order to meet the rest of the objectives for the class. So that's where I'm going to get into the main objective number one. We wanted to give students the freedom to think, to explore, and to make mistakes. And I'll, I'll make the analogy of riding a bicycle, teaching someone to ride a bike. Basically, we were up there in the front of the room, showing them what a bike looked like, showing them how to balance themselves on it, how to, hand, how to hold the handlebars, and how to turn the pedals. We actually never handed them the bike until the exam. And then we wondered why they fell and why they made mistakes. We weren't giving them the time to go through the, the portions of cognitive dissonance that you need in order to learn something, to truly reach out, learn something new, and make it part of what you already know, and then make it useful to you. And in order to do that, you need to make mistakes. You need to fail your way to success. We wanted to incorporate that into the classroom so that students could uh, 
explore the content, while at the same time, we were mentoring and helping them. Because typically what happens is students will form small groups, but they'll be outside of class. They'll have study groups on their own. And we don't have any input into understanding what they don't know, and they have no input from mentoring for us. So I wanted to bring that section into the classroom. So we looked at the technology what that was available, and we actually broke the students up into smaller asynchronous discussion groups outside of class. The asynchronous was done on purpose, so the students had time to think. They had time to research the databases. They had time to write and clarify their thoughts before they turned in their discussion post. Of course, the undergraduate teaching assistant was there as their mentor, driving critical thought, and students could think about how they wanted to answer each other if they had time to do so, rather than pushing them under, a, under the gun of time. So the setup of the discussion boards, well, they had three options. The student could pick a question. In other words, they can write a detailed question explaining what they didn't know, and then up to where they thought they knew, and then where their understanding went off. Other students could do peer mentoring. They could post a proposed answer to a colleague, because as everyone knows, uh, some of the best ways to learn is to teach. And of course, these very same students now were taking what we were saying, and they were translating it into a different language that other students could understand. It was another way of saying it. The student would pick a topic as far as any type of uh, post they wanted to make that was agreeing with us or disagreeing with anything that was in class or an expansion on it. Um, but they had to use scholarly references, and they had to make attempts at falsification. If you were posing a counter hypothesis, you had to say so. And students soon found out that every place you went into the literature, the scientific literature, you could find someone else who disagreed. So they could now practice this disagreement with each other by debating in the classroom. So they were allowed to explore and to question and even to be wrong. There were clear objectives. We did have grading rubrics for them, examples of graded posts, so they knew what we wanted from them. This is an example of what our discussion board rubric looked like, so that they could craft them properly. Uh, and for those who wanted something more concrete, we actually gave them examples of graded posts, so they knew exactly what was expected of them. We stayed out of the discussions totally for the week that they went on, because if we went into the groups, you could be guaranteed that all discussion would stop because they would expect, expect us to tell them the answers. But we could see the thought process, and we could actually see where the misunderstandings were occurring, and we could see how generalized it was. Because you have to understand, if I have 10 groups or 12 groups in a class, and I have misunderstandings in all 12 groups in the same place, most likely it's our communication that's the problem and not their understanding. So we can fine tune to where the important things that students needed to know what we were failing to communicate properly. The undergraduate TAs did the mentoring for us, and they also did triaging for us of what areas were most confusing. Now, this is just some snippets of what some of the discussion posts looked like. You can actually see that students were exploring content. They were asking questions. If you look at the middle one, the student is actually saying, am I thinking about this in the wrong way completely? He was asking his colleagues. And then, this is another one that's showing you some snippets that students were actually answering each other, back and forth, and engaging the content, engaging each other in scientific debate. This is another one that just shows you what a complete post actually looked like. So you can see how they, they wrote their post in a very um, professional way, and they used references. They reached out into the databases, into information that they were not familiar with necessarily. Uh, Paul and I often would read much of what they put up there at times because they were bringing some of the newer research into the discussions. Now what happened was that the undergraduate TAs would look through these discussion posts and any thread that did not resolve itself, where students didn't come to the right conclusion, where there was some misunderstanding of uh, content, they would send us those particular threads. We would answer them and we would put up something called a discussion board clarification once a week. Now in this way, we weren't honing in on any one particular student and telling them they were right or wrong. Instead, we were addressing the thread as a whole. And we would post answers such as this. We would clarify for the students different areas of confusion. 
And again, these were triaged by the TA so that we didn't have to answer every single thread. There was only the most important points that students needed to understand in order to do well on exams. This again is some snippets of some of the things that Paul would do, if you notice. He would pay attention to the fact that he would tell them that their discussion was excellent and vital. He would then look at one particular question that a student was asking, and he would call attention to it, and then he would answer the question and clarify for them. Students often use these to study for exams. We could then take those very same discussion posts and we could create e-quizzes, focusing in on the most difficult parts that they were having a hard time with, writing questions that honed in on those areas so that students could, again, make mistakes before the exams occurred and that we could find out how much of this was, was continuing throughout the course and how much of it they were, we were teaching them as we went along. I can show you the preliminary results of eight years of longitudinal data for this approach. Uh, this is just the preliminary results of a portion of it. Um, it does appear it had a tremendous effect on student learning. We have three multiple choice exams, and this was over time. If you notice the three exams, students did better and better every year. Uh, these were raw score exam scores, and they were also controlled for difficulty over time. And you can see how much better the students did. And also, if you look at the green line there, you'll see that we increased the level of difficulty on the last exam uh, to see if students came all the way down to where they started, and they did not. They had still continued to learn. Part of this is this ratchet effect, what we call a ratchet effect, because as we learn what students are in understanding, we get better and better at communicating, and our lectures get better and better over time. So it's basically a feedback loop that increases student learning over time. And then we looked at the online classes, and as you can see, the online did just as well uh, when you compare them to the live classes. One important point that you, I have to make is that the learning management system in an online class like this needs to be very organized. Students, students need to know exactly where they have to go for their assignment and what they have to do. Uh, any learning management system will do. This is a private one through streaming tutors that we use. You can do the same thing through Blackboard or any other learning management system that's out there. So it's basically very simple. Some additional online benefits. You can capture the lecture videos. Um, Paul and I did this in a small seminar class in the professional TV studio, but you don't necessarily have to do that. You can use other methods of capturing your videos. And then the entire course becomes asynchronous. So now you can add in other countries because the time differences are not that difficult to maneuver through. And the interesting part about that is you can have other student views as the students interact with each other on the discussion boards. I'll give you one funny story. Uh, we had students from the United States that were discussing uh, content with students from the University of Manchester. And it had to do with history. And the student from the United States said something like, uh, when we won the war, talking about World War II. And of course, the University of Manchester quickly corrected them and said, oh, you mean when the Allies won the war. <laughs> so students start to realize that the world looks different. It's not always from their little narrow perspective. They start to learn other perspectives, and it's a wonderful thing to see when you can put the entire course online like this and do it in an asynchronous manner. Now I'll get to main objective number two, which was the redeployment of faculty time when we didn't have to spend our time doing the lectures every single time we gave the course. We could prevent intellectual dropouts. As many of you are probably aware, online learning men and students, we get lost in the shuffle. But we can engage them early because we could see that they weren't participating in the class and we could reach out to them and bring them in. I can't tell you how many students said, oh, I, I didn't think anybody was paying attention. And then they would suddenly engage in a way that, I, that was very exciting for us. There was, we could give acknowledgement of superior work. We could send out emails to best posters. And again, what I normally would see is a student would email me back saying, I can't believe that I'm hearing from you. This is wonderful. I didn't think that anybody knew we existed. You can identify exactly where the errors are and thinking are. You can look for is the problem that they're bringing prior knowledge in that's a mistake, or are they just putting the logic together incorrectly? You can identify skill building needs. Are they short in quantitative thought? Are they short in analytical reasoning? You can see these things. 
You can correct your lectures then and refine your communication appropriately. And the other thing, um, the, to identify and act on plagiarism. Plagiarism is an important thing that we have to identify within the online course environment. It's actually very easy to do. You can collect your discussion posts in a PDF or Word format, and you can enter them onto SafeAssign or Blackboard or your learning management system. And you just keep putting them in year after year, and after a while you can, you can check for plagiarism between courses, between students in different groups, and, and within the internet. And then you can put in prevention because you can see where they're doing it, and you can start to ask questions why. And then before the course begins, you can put in assets that will help and, and help students in preventing plagiarism from occurring in the first place. It's very important, though, to keep this at a very low level because you want to make sure that students feel as if their interests are being protected. And of course, you have time then to collaborate with other members of your teaching team. Periodically, for example, I talk to Carolyn Bauscher for to make sure we have a coherent course. I take my raw score grades and I give them to Carolyn, who then changes them over into University of Manchester grades, so that we're not changing any university policy between the two universities. Uh, we also have live review sessions, which are made possible by the e-learning team at the University of Manchester. They find new technology. As you can see, they've done a wonderful job. We do our review sessions in the same very venue. Uh, we drive them with the discussion posts. Sometimes students are shy to ask questions, and we have many questions from the discussion posts that we can then use. And of course, having this collaboration makes the live exams possible, which is very crucial to undergraduate learning. At this point, I'm going to turn over the mic to uh, Paul, and he'll tell you a little more from the tenured faculty side and how he thought about this whole process. Thank you, Joanne. So uh, I'm sort of a coda to this uh, conversation. Joanne is really the, uh, the expert. Uh, I was, when she and I began working together uh, over 10 years ago, I had 20 years of experience as a traditional research university faculty member. And I thought of teaching in that way. And after 20 years of experience in candor, I thought of myself as relatively skillful in doing this. But I can tell you that working with Joanne over the last 10 years has made me a vastly better and wiser teacher. Uh, I, the, this, the, the kind of pedagogical environment that she's just described to you is spectacularly successful in helping faculty members get better at what they do. And indeed, I think we're in a position now with the technology and the pedagogical advancements that have occurred over the last decade to, to begin to think in terms of a revolution in education. That is, teaching students better on the one hand and teaching a lot more students better on the other. So before I dive in, let me just make a couple of uh, technical points at a sort of strategic level. Firstly, these approaches that we've used now make it possible for us we, to teach uh, classes of at least five to 600 students, either live or online, very effectively. In fact, I would argue more effectively than we have traditionally taught students even in small live course settings because of the, the social effects that large groups can, be, uh, can bring to bear. Uh, I, uh, th that's, secondly, let me emphasize, at a strategic level, that the mechanics that Joanne just described to you, these asynchronous discussion groups, what they're allowing us to do is to come back and, and achieve this thing that has been the sort of unmet objective of educators for a long time and psychologists. And that is to stimulate what is referred to technically as active learning. That is uh, setting up a situation in which students don't just learn things transiently for an exam, but take ownership of the content, making it their own. And this uh, act of criticizing what you hear, challenging what you hear, uh, in the context of these asynchronous discussion groups is enormously powerful in achieving active learning. So let me now drop to a sort of low tactical level and, and talk about the advantages of this approach that Joanne's already mentioned to you, but from the point of view of, the, of individual faculty experience. So firstly, because we can produce these, uh, in the online context, we can produce the lectures if we wish, as we do here in a professional TV studio setting, but let me emphasize, as Joanne did, that's not necessary. That is, you can do uh, just a standard classroom capture and do quite uh, well online. That is, it's the pedagogical environment, not the slickness of the videos that makes the, the project work. But high production values make it less effortful and more comfortable for the students to absorb the content. So when you have that option, uh, certainly use it. 
But let's now be clear about what that lets you do as a faculty member. So this course, for example, we teach in a small live setting once every three to four years. Then we teach the online version of the course to various audiences, including the Manchester audience, summer, fall, spring, for three or four years, in other words, 12, 13 times since the last time we videotaped the lectures. Think about what that lets you do. It lets you first lavish enormous amounts of preparation onto the produced videotaped lectures. They become almost like professional one-act plays designed to maximize your impact on students. And of course, as I'll remind you in a moment, you have enormous amounts of uh, information to draw on when you're doing that preparation from the student feedback. Think of what else this lets you do then. Each of the times, each of the semesters when you're teaching the course online without producing new lectures, all of that effort that goes into communication in a lecture setting can now be redeployed. So as you were listening to Joanne, you might have been thinking, ooh, that sounds like a lot of work. Well, it is uh, some work for the faculty member. But remember that you're not lecturing. That is, that you have this opportunity to redeploy your efforts in, on a semester-by-semester -semester basis to engage the students in active learning to, to interact with them. Let me digress for a minute before I come back to the technical details again. There's something about this, this strong interaction with students that is a tremendous and initially unanticipated advantage to us as faculty members. When we teach the same content semester after semester, there is a tendency for us to become a little jaded. And when you're interacting with students who are questioning you, who are challenging what you say, or asking you to clarify things, it keeps the content alive. So for example, I read a lot of pieces of the primary literature for the first time, driven there by student posts, not as a result of my private uh, research professional experience. And it keeps the content alive and vibrant for the faculty member, uh, which is not to be sneezed at. It's an, an advantage of some uh, substantial um, uh, extent. Also, as I alluded to a moment ago, when you have 12 or 13 semesters of feedback from students, from multiple independent groups of students, you get extremely robust statistical picture of what's working and what's not working. We are all vulnerable to being narcissists as communicators. That is to saying, well, this is in my head, the words came out of my mouth, I therefore presume that what was in my head was recreated in someone else's head. And of course, that narcissistic view is almost always wrong, right? Communication requires this, it is a, it is a dialogue, not a monologue. And this asynchronous discussion group setting lets you have a dialogue with 500 students at a time with remarkable effectiveness. Finally, let me emphasize another point that Joanne made. And one of the things that has transformed my attitude toward teaching most dramatically in the decade I've been working with her. Individual faculty, and sometimes universities in which they're embedded, think of teaching as something faculty does with the help of staff. In point of fact, if you're going to do the kinds of things that we've done here effectively, this is a team of co-equal professionals. That is, faculty members need to begin to learn to think of themselves as content specialists with, with great expertise, of course, in their areas of, of interest, but in fact to be aware that fellow professionals with expertise in technology and in pedagogy are equally important to the yeah. task. And it, it's, that's a remarkably transformative vision of education. In some ways it actually takes kind of some of the stress off of you as an individual faculty member. It's not now only your job to make sure that 500 students uh, walk out of the class at the end uh, having learned as much as they could learn. It's the, it's the job of a team. And in fact, team members can criticize one another, suggest ideas, and if you're open to that, if you have that kind of attitude that this is a team sport, as we say in the US, uh, that it, it is a tremendously, what's the word I'm searching for, I guess, liberating experience as an educator. You now become much more effective. The work you do is much more rewarding, much more deeply satisfying. So the mechanics that Joanne has described here, and I'm sure we'd be willing to provide copies of the PowerPoints or other uh, uh, avenues for you to access this, this, these details again in the future. The mechanics of implementation, Joanne, is now refined to such a high degree that we are e extremely successful in teaching, much more successful than I was, I'm sad to say, in the first 20 years of my career before I started interacting with Joanne. So, we're now coming up at about 25 after the hour, and we want to make sure we leave enough time for you to ask questions. So I'm going to slide to the side and let Joanne slide back on camera, and we would uh, be happy, either of us, to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paul and Joanne. Are there any questions? 
The teaching assistants basically come from students who have taken the course the, the year before. I normally have um, applications for over 50 students, sometimes more for 12, 13 spots in a course. Um, we teach them, you know, we give them a little bit of training, but they know the content very well. They've been in the discussion boards already, so they know uh, what's worked for them. Uh, they they learn from the, the students that with the TAs before them and you before. So there's actually very little training that I have to do on my side because it's almost like a culture that the students pass on how to be a TA from one student to another. Um, it's worked out very well. It doesn't take a tremendous amount of my time. In fact, when we have TA meetings, those TAs are the ones that help me solve some of the problems that I see in the boards. Uh, they'll come up with ideas. That they'll tell me how students are thinking. They'll tell me what will work to, to motivate a student, which I never would have thought about. So they also become part of the team more than they become so much of a, a, a drag on your time, I would say. Let, let me add one a point to this, I think, as a faculty member. There's a, a, so faculty tend to have this fear that students are going to make mistakes. And they will, uh, ignoring the fact that faculty sometimes make mistakes, too. But the, uh, the, having a certain faith in the ability of undergraduate TAs to get in and, and do this with a, a, a large mistake benefit ratio, that is, they'll come in and they'll be successful in communicating with students uh, in ways that faculty members sometimes can't, right? There are generational dialogue issues, uh, uh, dialect issues, uh, things of that nature. So if, if, if one of your concerns is that the quality of the part of the puzzle the undergraduate bill may not be as high as it could be. Let me assure you that if you take the steps that Joanne just described, that is not an issue. These students come in and they make an enormous contribution. Let me finish this by making a point that Joanne often makes quite correctly. Students are going to talk to one another. They're going to learn from one another, correctly and incorrectly. The only question is, do you have access to those conversations or not? And if, you, if they're had asynchronously in the discussion board, you have access to Respond to the learning. And you can help the TAs too. You know, it continues to be a learning <coughs> because you can see what they're posting in response to the students. So you can you can check on them too. It isn't, you know, it sounds like it's a lot more work than it actually is. Uh, it, it isn't. You know, there's one. I have a uh, a manual that we made up during a, a semester that we were not teaching, and we give the manual out to students to the TAs, and the TAs basically just follow. You know, Uh, and it, it becomes like a, a very easily becomes a well of machine. And it doesn't need to be for, you could do this for 100 students if you wanted to, you don't have to do it for 5 to 900. I think this uh, fantastic idea is something that I'm going to be suge suggesting to the academics that are in I can't hear. We're having a little trouble hearing.
ends it. Yes, I can see, we can see them as they're going on. Uh, in fact, the, these posts are graded. It's very easy to grade them. We do have a grader that grades them according to the rubric, so they're basically very easy to grade because we're not grading right or wrong as much as we're grading critical thought. Uh, so yes, you can see what they do. Uh, like I said, we don't go in because if we go in directly, you'll start to see that all debate will stop. Uh, we only go in after the due date, and we only respond to threats as a whole, not to individual students. Uh, we do sometimes respond to individual students through these emails or through gradebook, but we do not respond to them, you know, openly in the discussion boards as one-on-one. -on -one. Let me just add one small clarification to what Joanne just said. There's a balance in the student psychology here. On the one hand, if you um, are interacting with them moment to moment in the asynchronous discussion boards, they tend to become passive, as they would be in a lecture setting. That is, of course, uh, a death to this kind of approach. On the other hand, if they feel that you have no awareness of what they're doing, then they tend to treat it just as a technical exercise. Whereas if they are aware that you're observing them from a distance, but you're not directly involved, that kind of sets the, this intermediate psychology which seems to work optimally. And one point that you made that is very important is that they are like translators to the because we're saying it a certain way. And sometimes we could say it over and over again in the same way five times, and the student doesn't get it. And one of their colleagues will say it in a slightly different language, in a vernacular, in a slightly different way, and all of a sudden, you know, a good amount of students get it. So, you know, that just even using it, they're, they're translating the content. It's tremendously effective. Can I, let me just ask one last thing. You mentioned that um, you grade them with the rubric. Do you use those grades in towards a final assessment grade at all? Do they contribute? I, I can't hear. Maybe you can repeat the question again. Oh. The, the grades that you use for the discussion forums via the rubrics, the grades for the students, do they contribute towards their final grade for the module? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. They normally, what we do is they have 12 discussion posts assigned during the term. They drop two so that if they have a bad day or whatever, or um, and they happen to get sick, they don't have to worry about catching up. Um, and it co comes out to 10, so it's a total of 250 points. And it actually it counts as if it were one exam grade. The one quarter of their total score. This, is, this point is actually crucial. The level of incentive is really important here. If there's too much or too little, uh, students don't react productively. And I think Joanne has experimented with that over the last decade. And this having it make 20 to 25% of the grade is appropriate. It still means, of course, that students are being evaluated based on their exam performance as in traditional courses. So faculty need not fear a loss of rigor, for example. And yet, your the uh, discussion board participation is important enough that students are incentivized to to engage. And, and what you're really doing is you you are grading their level of engagement in the discussion boards more than anything else. Their professionalism. You're teaching them how to communicate with each other. That's what you're grading. And what you tend to see is that some students will consistently engage throughout the class, and you start to see that it does match their their exam grades. And you'll see some that will start to slack off. And if you send them an email, you'll see them start to pick up because they think somebody's paying attention to what they're doing. Uh, you'll see some that you know are transient in and out, just like they would be in a normal you know class environment. And you know that's up to them how much they want to engage. So it's not like you have all students get all 250 points because that is not the case. Are there any other questions? Could I ask a quick question? Do you ever find a student over dominates a discussion board or intimidates? Yes, we do. So how Occasionally, do you deal with that? we don't have to deal with it. The students deal with it very well. Uh, normally, if it's out of hand, let's say a, a student, I'm, I'm going to make something up that's a little bit absurd. Let's say we had a student arguing with another student, saying, you know, you write like a third grader. Okay. In that case, normally the TAs, because the undergraduate TAs do monitor the discussions every day, they would let me know about it, and I would go in and I would do something about it. I would either delete the post, and then I would uh, talk to the student you know, separately. That normally does not happen in all the years we've been doing this. Normally, it's the students who stop it. Uh, the students will, will uh, insist 
on engagement in the content and not make anyone over-dominate. Uh, they surprised me. I did not expect that. I thought we were going to have to go in a little more than we did, and I was very surprised that once you liberated everyone, they actually kept each other in check. Let me add to that. that yeah, I think this is a really important point. Something about the asynchronous discussion groups is that uh, you know gender, race, size, who's big, who's small, play no role in the process. So it's a kind of remarkably democratized environment. And in that environment, students feel quite confident in reacting to something that they regard as ethically inappropriate. So if someone is abusive, if someone is um, uh, off topic, students are very quick to step in and say, let's come back and, and, and stay on topic. So in the rubric, there, one of the rules is that you're not allowed, you're always, you can always attack a position, never attack a person. We enforce that with rigor. If someone, in a very rare case where you have an abusive student, they're simply deleted from the discussion boards and are not allowed to participate. But as Joanne mentioned, that is surprisingly rare. There is kind of a, a consensual law enforcement that goes on in the discussion boards. And that's, in fact, one of the elements of practice here is the size of those boards. Yes. If they're too small or too large, you either get one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions dominating or you get a sense of crowd anonymity dominating. By setting them up with the right scale, and Joanne can comment on that scale in a moment, you get these benevolent effects that we've just been talking about. The other thing is with the students choosing what they're going to uh, respond to, in other words, they're choosing what to discuss, they're spread out. So for one student to dominate every single discussion within that, that forum that week is very difficult to happen. And a lot of times you'll see that person, that student being alone because everyone else is just moving to something else and just don't respond to them. And that usually stops the problem. So what is a good scale? What, what's a group dynamic that works? The, the group dynamic on the undergraduate side is usually I put approximately 50 students in a group. Uh, if you cut it, you can hand drop it down to probably 30 to 35 and it would work fine. Because like I said, not every student is going to post every single week. Uh, you can drop it down to 35 and it works great. As soon as you get it down to less than 20, you start to have a problem where there just isn't enough of the dynamic for self-correction. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? No? In that case, I'd like to thank you both very much indeed for, in, for joining us. And uh, it's really been really great hearing from you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure always.